It is good to see everybody here tonight. Um, we do not have choir practice um, because Whitey had his surgery today. So Sandra is at the hospital with him. Good news is that surgery went well, that there was, and it's done. He did, once they got him in a room, he was in severe pain. Um, so remember to pray for Whitey and Sandra to get all of that taken care of. Thank you, Jim, for covering for me last week. Um, I was joking. I can't remember if I said this Sunday or not. I, I said it to somebody. I said, you, I said, what'd you do over Easter break? And they said, we did that. I said, I got a tattoo. <laughs> it's not. Um, you don't realize how much you move your muscles in the top of your arm until you've got a bunch of stitches going across there, and every time you move your fingers, it pulls those stitches. So I was telling Jim, it doesn't hurt like it did, but it's just it's that aggravating pain that just every time you do something, it's just that little ache. You can feel it. But it is good to be back. Thank you, Jim, for covering last week and, and getting us through verse 14 of Daniel chapter 7. And we're going to do our best to finish chapter 7 tonight. Since we don't have choir practice, we can go a little bit longer. So um, we are going to start in verse 15 tonight. But before we do that, we're going to open up in prayer. And um, if you would join me as we go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our time together. Our blessed Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everything that you're doing for us. Thank you for what you're doing in my life and what you're showing me and, and where you're leading me. Lord, I thank you for that. I ask you to be with us as we go through this this Bible study tonight as we look at the interpretation of these this dream that Daniel had about the four beasts. The Lord, help us to understand. Help us to see and help us to seek Your face in understanding what Your Word says. And let us remember this also, dear Lord, that Your Word is truth. I ask You to bless this time and in everything that we do and say, may it be an honor to You. And it's in the holy and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Okay, so like I said, this is the interpretation of the dream that Daniel had about the four beasts. So let's start off by looking at verses 15 and 16 first. And this is what it says here in Daniel chapter 7. It says, As for me, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within me, and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. I approached one of those who were standing by and, be, and began asking him the exact meaning of all of this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. There is one other time so far in Daniel where he was concerned and his spirit was distressed when he saw or heard a dream. You guys remember when that other time was? Nebuchadnezzar about, about him being sent out and for seven years that he would, he would live as an animal and that he was going to be punished, or not punished, but God was going to do something drastic to get his attention. And he was distressed about that. Just think about this, this dream that Daniel had, these images that he saw and he wrote down. That's enough. Let's face it. There's horror movies that are made from that stuff. Those kind of imagery and what he saw. The different beast and the talking horns and, and everything like that. That would make a scary movie, wouldn't it? But it's reality. That's what Daniel saw in his dream, and it distressed him. It bothered him. The King James Version uses another word. Um, it grieved him. Okay? It, but it distressed him. But what does it say was distressed? His spirit within me. You, 
you know when something happens, it may bother you, but it's a superficial bother. And, not, and, I, and I, when I say superficial, I don't mean that it's not really a bother. That it, 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 is, it is bothers you, but it's something you deal with and go on. But then there's other things that happen that shake you to your core. And you feel it deep down. And you can't shake it. That's what He's saying here. That's what it means that within Him, His body... His spirit within him was distressed. And this is actually one of the, the first times that it combines the idea that a spirit within the body. Look at 1 Timothy 4.8. He says, For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for this present life and also for the life to come. The Spirit within me, the Spirit, now this is what we have to understand about the Spirit. The Spirit, can the Spirit die? No. Body can die. The Spirit cannot. The soul, I think the King James Version says the soul. Uh, the soul goes on forever. Unlike some people that believe in reincarnation that your soul transfers from one eye from you to something else after you die, it that doesn't happen. Scripture says, "For it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment." What is it that faces that judgment? Is it our earthly body? No. It is our soul, our spirit. Those of us that have been born again in Christ, we receive a spiritual body. We, re we, we receive that perfect body. But it's our soul that lives on. Our spirit. Um, okay, so look here in verses 17 and 18. And this is a summary of this vision that he's had. And this is what it says. He says, These great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who arise from the earth. But the saints of the Most High One will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. So let's take this in order. These four beasts represent four kings who arise from the earth. This divine interpretation of the dream. Now remember, he's asking someone who is standing there in his dream to, to interpret, tell him what this is meaning. So, who gave him this dream in the first place? What? No, who gave, who gave Daniel this dream? God gave it to him. So we can see this as a divine interpretation because he's receiving the interpretation because he asked for it in his dream. And, and, and God is giving him this interpretation. And, and so this is, this is the, the person that, the, that is interpreting says this four great beasts were four in number, or four kings who arise from the earth. And, and this part seems to coincide with the first dream that Nebuchadnezzar had about the, the statue that, that was made of four different metals and it be in four different kingdoms coincides with that. Okay? Um, And now look at this, it says, but the saints of the high, highest one, King James Version says the most high, will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Now let me tell you something that I'm learning in Hebrew. <coughs> we think there's a, a, a big difference between the, the interpretation of the different 
versions of the Bible, King James Version, New King James, you know, all NIV, NASB, there are. Some of them have gone way too far and they've watered down the message. But what I am learning is I'm learning Hebrew with the Old Testament. It is not as a precise language as Greek is for the New Testament. There, is, there are certain words that they can only mean this one thing. But there is another word, depending on how it's used, can mean two or three different things. And it's up to the person interpreting it to determine which one of those. Now, they're all similar things. There is one that's different, though. There is a word, a verb, that uh, means to cut off or to cut. And it's the word that's used when, like he says, if you, are, if you do this, you will be cut off from your people. That's the word that it, that's used. But if it's used in conjunction with another word, it means to make. I don't understand it. The teacher can't explain why it's that way. He just says it is. Okay? But that's what we have to understand when we're reading this. Now, the thing about Daniel, it was not written in Hebrew. We talked about that. It was mostly written in Aramaic. Why? Because he was in Babylon. What was the language of Babylon? Aramaic. He was writing what he knew. Okay? But here, talking about the Most High, look at these verses. Verses Revelation 5, 5 and 6, talking about the, the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all the ages to come. Revelation 5, 5 and 6 says this, And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Then Revelation 5, 8 through 10 says this, when he has taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy of you are you who take the book and break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe, tongue, and nation, and people and nation. You have made them to be to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So how is Daniel and his vision saying that the saints of the Most High or the High One will receive a kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come? And then John writes almost the exact same words in Revelation. How does that happen? Go ahead. I know you got something you want to say. And it very well may have been the same thing. But I like Paul's explanation. You know what Paul's explanation for that is? For all Scripture is inspired. What does that word inspired mean? It means God breathed. That's what that word means. Only God can take people separated by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and miles yes and 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 they put together a book 66 books written by different authors across the span of time that's unbelievable and it fit together as Forrest Gump would say like peas and carrots a hand in glove it 
fits together perfectly. So it, it, it may, they may have been seeing part of the same vision at this point because there are a lot of co correlation between Revelation and what Daniel sees and the prophecies that Daniel makes. So let's keep going with this. But the one thing we know is that out of all of this, these four kings, they're going to rise and they're going to fall. And who's going to be standing at the end? The Most High and His saints. That's what I keep telling people. You know, back several years ago when we, I was a youth pastor, before we got out, we, we finished the building, we were back here in this meeting in the fellowship hall wing with the youth, and somebody somewhere that the world's going to end on such and such a day. And there were even billboards and everything up that the world is ending on such and such a date. And it had some of the kids scared to death. Some of them were terrified. <coughs> I was like, guys, why are you worrying? Read the end of the book. We win. <laughs> we don't win. We're just on the winning side because God wins. We're on the winning side. There's nothing to be afraid of. Plus the fact this guy's off his rocker because the Bible says, Jesus says, not even I know the time. And Jesus is the one that's coming back. And if He doesn't know when He's coming back, how in the world is some schmo going, going to, to count, count the clouds or the stars and, and say, because of their aligning this way, this is when the world's going to end. He doesn't know. Jesus is not going to come back according to our timetable. He's going to come back when God tells him, go get our children. That's when he's coming back. So, anyway, that's, that's my little soapbox for that. Okay, so... Look at this point. When the days of the fourth beast is over, then God's people receive the kingdom... Yet we know the Roman Empire is long gone and it doesn't seem that the saints have received the kingdom. This is what prompts many to, to look at either a spiritualized interpretation fulfilled in history or some kind of restoration of the Roman Empire in the last days. One that will literally fulfill the prophecy of the ten horns and the little horn as well. Don't know. But what I do know and what you, you need to hold on to and what I hold on to is the fact that the Most High and His saints rule forever. That even that kingdom is not going to last. So look at uh, 19 through 22. Then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with teeth of iron and its claws of bronze and which devoured, crushed, and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and the meaning of the ten horns that were on its head, and the other, other horn which came up, and before which three of them fell out, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boast, and which was larger in appearance than its associates. I kept looking and until the Ancient of Days. Oh, who is that? I kept looking, or I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the ancient of days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one, and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Daniel was interested in, in, in the whole vision, but he was particularly interested in the fourth beast because it was different than all the other beasts. He wanted that explained to him. He wanted to know about the horns. He wanted to know about all of it. It was different than everything, especially the horn. 
that was larger than its associates. Larger than it. it started out small, but it tore up two, three of the horns by its roots when it rose and it grew bigger and it had eyes and a mouth and it kept making boast and, and everything. The fourth beast interested Daniel because it was a great destructive power because of the conspicuous horn and because of the fight against God's people. The same horn was making war against the saints. That's what it says there. That it was waging war against the saints. Look here in Revelation 2.17 and Revelation 13.17. Or excuse me, 13.7. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who kept the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And then in 13.7 it says, It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. If this fourth beast represents the Antichrist. And he fights against the saint. It does not necessarily mean that the church will be on the earth. You, you understand that. We say not necessarily because saints can indicate the church of a Jewish remnant in the tribulation period. We know that God, I mean, it's all through Scripture. God reserves Himself a remnant. He told Elijah that. I have reserved Myself a remnant among My people. We know in the contrary to what the Jehovah's Witness say, that when it talks about the 144,000 in Revelation, it's talking about 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. 144,000 people, saints that are reserved, that are a remnant for God. That is strictly, listen, like I said, this is not Jehovah's Witness. This is not Baptist. This is, this is Jewish people that are a remnant to God. Okay, you guys understand that. 12,000 from each tribe. And this is a very good thing. I mean, what you guys said. This goes hand in hand with what Daniel has seen and what John saw in his revelation. And what he wrote down. They are going together like this. Okay, look at 23 through 27. Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms, and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one, and he will intend to make alterations in times and in law. And there will be given into his hand for a time, times and a half a time, but the court will sit for judgment and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the sovereignty, the dominion and the greatness of all kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be everlasting kingdom and all the dominions will serve and obey Him. So let's take all this in order again. The fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom. The initial uh, description of the four beasts fits with this well with the Roman Empire of the ancient, his of the ancient history. The Roman Empire that was in place when Christ came. All of that fits together with what he is seeing here. Why do we say that? Well, again, let's look at the next place. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings will arise. These ten kings do not have a literal fulfillment in the Roman Empire of history. 
If they are literal, they are still in the future. The only way to this has been fulfilled in the, in the spiritualize this property and take away its plain sense. I honestly believe from this point on, these ten, the beast represents the, the Roman Empire. But the ten horns, that's something yet to come. It's not something that happens because why, why do I say that? Because this tenth horn or this conspicuous horn, the little horn that rises up, it rises up from among those ten kings and it tears out, takes the place of three of those kings. Does that, you, you understand what I'm saying? So I do think because of what Daniel's vision is and what he is hearing, that that is the same as the Antichrist in Revelation. And I do agree. I think they're seeing the same vision. Okay. I think it's because it... it I honestly, and I, I have to do some studying on that because the, the headquarters of the Roman Catholic Church is in Vatican City, which is in Italy. It's outside of Rome. It, it, yeah, it's, 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 it's literally, from what people say, is the smallest country there is. Um, I do know that the smallest, the smallest area that has its own area code is the guardhouse at Vatican City. I do know that. But they do. But that's not scriptural either. Um, Yeah, that that and there is a possibility, especially if you get into a lot of the the political side of the of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I don't know enough about that to say yes or no, but I can say that that, that may be the case, but I can't say for sure. Yeah. Okay. He speaks out against the most high or the high the, the 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 highest one the little horn spoke pompous blasphemous words perhaps like the fascist creed of italy that is cited in talbot you guys realize that fascism and marxism and the first thing they do is destroy they want to take god out of all of it Sort of sounds like our what our country's going through right now. They don't want even those that claim to be children of Christ, they don't they want to make God say what they want him to say and not listen to what he has to say. But listen to this. This is the 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 fascist creed of Italy. I believe in in Rome eternal the mother of my fatherland, and in Italy her firstborn, who was born of her virgin womb by the grace of God, who suffered under the barbarian invader, was crucified, slain, and buried, who descended into the sepulcher and rose from the dead in the 19th century, who ascended to heaven in her glory in 1918 and 1922 by the march on Rome, who was 
seated at the right hand of Mother Rome, who will come thence to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the genius of Mussolini, in our Holy Father, fascism, and in the com- communion of, the, of its martyrs, in the conversion of the Italians, and in the resurrection of the empire. Amen. What is that copy? That 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 copies the Apostles' Creed. It copies the Apostles' Creed, but it puts its own stuff in there. And the attributes that were given to Christ are given to who? Rome. Okay. So that's the type of words you you guys understand what blasphemy blasphemy is, right? It's giving credit that belongs to God somewhere else. When God is worthy of worship and we do not we take that worship away from him and place somewhere else, that's blasphemy. And notice this, it says that he will wear down the saints of the highest one. This speaks of a cruel and systematic pressure coming from the word to wear away or to wear out as friction wears clothes or shoes. It's that constant pressure that He's going to be applying to the saints of God that are here on earth to wear them out, to persecute them. You know, um, if if you're hunting, and you're running, and I, I don't do this, but it, say if you're running dogs on deer, there's some states that allow that. If you are running dogs on deer, and those dogs continually pursue that deer, eventually, what's going to happen to that deer? It's going to it's going to kill over. Its heart's going to explode from fright, from pressure to keep that keeping on going. It's just going to drop over dead. Um, that's the same thing. You guys know when you work and you're using your hands and you keep you keep doing and it hurts and you keep going. What eventually happens to your hands? You wear a what? A blister on your hands. That's from the friction. That's the same idea that's going on here. That it's going to be wore out. You're going to get, you know, you rub your pants. You, you get in and out of your car and you slide across the seat at the same time, in the same place every time. Eventually, there's going to be a hole that develops in, in your car seat because of the friction. That's what it's talking about here. It's that same type of pressure that's going to be in, on the people of God. And then it says, He will intend to make alterations in times and in law. This little horn will intend to change times and law, perhaps as the French Revolution where radicals wanted to institute a 10-day work week and declared 1972 the year of the revolution, or excuse me, 1792. I got dyslexic. Okay, 1792, the the year of the revolution, they wanted to, to, to change the time So that was year one. So France would have a different calendar than everybody else. It would be 2024. But from 1992, it would have been year 220 or 32. 232 years? Is that right? So it would be year 232 instead of 2024. Changing time and place. 
Check this out. I didn't know this, but Seventh-day Adventists have historically taught that it was the papacy, Roman Catholic Church, which changed the time and law by moving the Lord's Day from Saturday to Sabbath Day to Sunday. Some traditional Seventh-day Adventists therefore regard Sunday's worship as the sign of the Antichrist. Changing time and laws. We know for a fact that when... What is one act that the Antichrist, according to Revelation, is going to do? He's, he's going to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. What's He going to do in that temple? Does, does Revelation tell us? And, and He's going to sacrifice something that God has said will never be sac should never be sacrificed to him. If you if you remember. Um, there are changing the laws. Changing the laws. Now here is the interesting thing. Check this out. There will be given into his hand for a time, times and half a time. The power of the little horn over the saints is limited. It will last for three and one half years. Hmm. See, when it says time, that's a period of one year. Times is a period of two years. And half a time, half a year. Where else do we see three and a half years? First part of the tribulation. Well, and it's also the second part of the tribulation because the tribulation is the, is, the, is the seven years and it's going to be the second three and a half years where the pressure is going to be put on the, uh, the saints of God to the point where he, they're being killed, they're being persecuted, everything else. That it's going to be terrible the second two and a half years, or three and a half years. Um, but look at Revelation 11, verses 2 and 3. Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 12 Hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. Then Revelation twelve six. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God, so that there she would be nourished for one thousand two hundred and forty six days or sixty days. One thousand two hundred and sixty days. Revelation 13.5, there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and the authority to act for 42 months was given to him. <coughs> and you see the, well I know you, we've talked about this, but you see the relation between what Daniel was seeing and what John saw? Only God could do that. Only God could do that. And that's also why there are people that claim that Daniel was not written in Babylon, but it was written later. Because they can't, they can't see Daniel being able to prophesy as, as well as he did. Now here is the his dominion will be taken away, annihilated and destroyed forever. In the day of persecution by the blasphemous ruler, the Messiah will establish his kingdom for his people. Because the kingdom of Jesus immediately secedes the fourth kingdom, no event in the past answers the prediction in the smallest degree. Certainly, the church did not cause a sudden and catastrophic fall of the Roman Empire. It is a questionable. It is questionable whether the Roman Empire had any serious opposition from the Christian Church 
or that the growing power of the church contributed to a major way in its downfall. So there are three hop options in interpreting the kingdom's establishment here. One, there is no fulfillment. Daniel is an error. Two, the fulfillment is symbolic in church history. Or three, the fulfillment is literal and yet future. Has what Daniel described fully happened yet? Has what John described fully happened yet? But obviously, according to Scripture, it's going to happen. There are some that, have, that will tell you, well, this is just allegorical. You can't take it literally. I am a very literal person. <laughs> and yes, I believe that God spoke the world into existence. I believe that He created Adam and Eve because it says so in the Bible. I believe Jesus came. He walked this earth for three and a half years. He ministered. He died and was crucified. He was buried. He rose again. Why? Because Scripture says it happened. Do I know the, the exact day? No, I can't tell you the exact day it happened. All I know is that it happened because the Bible says. Everything else in the Bible is true. Why would this not be true to you? You understand, if you can disprove one part of the Bible, you can disprove it all. What's that? Yeah, you can't. There's some things you just have to accept on faith. Well, I got you one better. God said it doesn't matter if you believe it, and that settles it. That, that's, the, that's the truth. Doesn't matter if we believe it or not. If God said it, that's the end of it right there. So, and, and you're right, Celeste. There's no point. Again, people ask me all the time. Well, what do you what do you think? Are you pre-tribulation rapture, mid-tribulation rapture, or post-tribulation rapture? I, that's it. All I know is Jesus is Jesus promises to return for me. And if, and if it's before the, ra the tribulation period, awesome. If it's in the middle of the tribulation, awesome. If it's after the tribulation, awesome. The fact is, He's coming back. That's what we have to focus on. And again, read the end of the book. <laughs> and, and be ready. Be ready. That's right. The, Daniel says the same thing as the end of the book. The sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. We win. And then look at verse 28. At this point, the revelation ended. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming me, and my face grew pale, but I kept the matter to myself. Can you imagine if he would have shared this with anybody? What they would have thought? Exactly, Donna. They would have thought that he was nuts off his rocker. They would have literally thought he was nuts. And, and it says, my thoughts were greatly alarming me. There was a lot of stuff in here that, that because nowhere does it say when this was going to happen. What Daniel wrote down. Now here, it said at the very beginning, Daniel summarized all this. He didn't write down word for word what happened and what he saw. He summarized it. He wrote down what he thought was the most important stuff for his readers to know. He recorded it. Summarized it. But there was a lot of things even in the summary that's there that, that, that are troubling. That would weigh heavy on somebody. To the point that it made his face, it changed his countenance. His face grew pale. It worried him. Daniel was so convinced that his, this prophecy, this vision that God gave him was, was true 
that it literally changed him. Now here is my question to you. Are we so convinced that what God has told us is true that we allow it to change us? Just keep that and think about that the rest of this week. Think about, do we allow what God tells us to change us? And going back to what Joe said, this is one thing we got to remember. This is how God speaks to us. This is not an emotional book. This is not a only if I feel good book. This is not an only if I feel bad book. This is truth. Truth is not regardless of what people say. There cannot be two different truths. What is true for me and what is true for you, they cannot be separate things. There is only one truth. If it's not the truth, what is it? A lie. And we have to read this Bible as truth. In the story. Because God settled it, or said it, that settles it whether or not we believe it or not. Okay? God said it, and that's it. The other way God speaks to us is how? Through prayer. Prayer, not just telling Him our wish list, but earnestly pouring our hearts out to Him, and then be quiet and listen. The third way God speaks to us is through other Christians. Other godly people that are reading, that are praying, and they will speak truth into you also from God. Now please understand what I'm saying. I'm not telling you that they're going to come out and say, I had a vision and God said for you to do this. That's not what I'm talking about. But they're going to speak truth and they're going to affirm what God is telling you. I always talk to Ginger about decisions. And I can tell you that every time that she has affirmed what I felt God leading me to do, it has worked out perfectly. Because I waited for that affirmation and making sure that I was hearing exactly what God was telling me to do. So, keep that in mind. Okay, thank you. Um, Joe, would you dismiss our Bible study time and prayer, and then we'll go into our prayer time. Thank you, sir. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the Bible, the truth. I search for the truth, Lord, all my life. Truth. The truth is truth, not spelled T R U T H, it's J E S U S. So, Lord, there is no gray with God. It's either right or it's wrong, it's in your will or it's out of your will. But we like gray. So, Lord, thank you that you wrote it down, plain and simple. Not only what happened in the past, what is happening today and what's going to happen to the future. The Lord again, thank you for this. Thank, thank you for our pastor. Thank you for the time and the energy and his willingness to study the word, Lord, to, to explain the word so that we get it. And so now, Lord, we, we want to be obedient. Jesus only asked us to do two things before he went back to heaven. One is love. And tell as many people about him that will listen. So, Lord, may we be obedient. May we love one another. And may we go make disciples of other people so that they can go to heaven with us. So, thank you most of all for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joe.